right. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Hopefully everything is coming through fine and dandy. Um, if anyone can't hear me, then shout in the chat. Um, right. This evening, it's another, it's the second session in the kind of Freudian spaceship group discussion, conversation, dynamic thing that we're trying to set up. Um, there's a couple of people in, in already. Um, uh, so I will get those in and we'll say hi and then we'll have a little natter, hopefully, about what we're going to do. I've got a couple of ideas, but other people might have their own. So um, let's just bring people in. Uh, hi, Gabby. Hi, Robbie. Hi, sorry. Hi, Rob. And hi, Morrigan. Hey. Do you want to all say hi just to make sure you're all sound sound live? Hi there. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. Everyone's there. Good. And there's Sam and Betty just coming in. We'll just do a, a quick live check when that's done. How is everybody this evening? <sighs> Yeah, pretty good, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, what happens if right. we do that? What happens if so we do so. that? So so. Uh, Sam and Batty, hello, hello, Sam and Batty. Are you there? Are you there? Calling the internet, Sam and Betty. I don't know. Are they there? I don't think we. I don't think they can hear us at the moment. So, uh, has anyone? Got, if anyone's got any particular ideas of something they want to do this evening, that's absolutely great, of course, um, and we can do that. If not, or if not, no specific things are popping along at the moment. Um, ah, hi, Hang, Sam and Betty. Can you do a quick sound check? Hello, say hi. Hi. Hi, 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 hi. Right. So, uh, just to everyone who's watching, if they if they are at some point, uh, this is our Freudian spaceship group conversation. Um, so, what I was just saying is, if anyone's got any particular ideas of anything they want to do tonight, that's absolutely great. Otherwise, uh, we can we can have a have a you know we can look at that and do that. Um, but if not, I have uh, as as I said as I posted on River, I've got a little little bit of uh, William Burroughs that I thought might be interesting to look at, um, particularly this little tiny text. And the reason the reason I wanted to look at this tiny text is because it's William Burroughs, and I love William Burroughs, and he's always really useful and interesting, and the cut-ups and things like this, I think, are a really useful kind of technique to think about, as is this do easy technique of William Burroughs. Um, but specifically for our kind of conversations, it connects towards the end of the of the short story, um, there's a direct connection with a relationship to the Freudian id, and to that kind of sense of the of 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 of, of the drive overwhelming us, being an, a kind of an opponent at one point, or something we have to work with as a kind of counter, um, an irrational element of our of ourselves or whatever we want to call the id. Um, so that's why I picked that particular essay because it kind of connects in with. Uh, uh, they end with the Freud and might might enable us to have a bit of a conversation about the it and what we think the id is and desire, possibly. And also there's interesting stuff in the Burroughs itself. Okay, we've got another person in, which is Sheila. <laughs> who is Sheila? Say hello. Is that some... Who is Sheila? <laughs> that might be John or something. I don't know. Say hi when you come in, Sheila. Um does that anyway, anyway roughly speaking what, what what are the thoughts on that on that looking at william burroughs for for the first sort of 20 minutes half an hour how does that sound yeah i'm that's good yeah i'm up for that sounds cool we're all up for that it'd probably be nice and relaxed because essentially what i thought oh, yeah, i might I mean, do I, I, um, is go on go, go, i go. am up for i am up for it i and i um just you know that he killed his wife and he said women were an evolutionary error i mean i am that, that, i'm just no putting that there you know i think that ought to be I think, acknowledged you know, so yeah yeah very good point that's excellent good yes um i'm still waiting for sheila to come in, come on <laughs> with a name a name listed that we haven't seen before um <clears throat> They apparently have network connections at the moment. Um, oh, there's a dog for Sam and Betty. Um, okay, anyone else? Any thoughts before we before we do that? Because it might be something we don't want to do. It might be something we'd rather I can I can talk, talk about secondhand rather than put his actual work out there. Um, 
I'm okay with it. We're okay talking with about it. it. Okay. Oh, hello, Sheila. Hello, Sheila. <laughs> Come in, Sheila. <laughs> it's like a seance, isn't it? It's Sheila, like not the rhymes on the point. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell you what. While we're while we're waiting for Sheila to connect, there's a little bit of video. It's only three and a half minutes, three minutes forty nine seconds. So I thought maybe we could have a look at that, and then if everyone's comfortable and Sheila's connected, I will just read for about fifteen minutes a sort of section of the boroughs that works. It's the last kind of chunk of the text, um, and then we can have a bit of a conversation if that sounds like a plan. So let me just bring up. Uh, you should all be able to see, um, uh, wrong, wrong tab, wrong tab, wrong tab, this tab. You should all be able to see the tab when I bring it in. Let's, let's see. Right. Can you all see this? Mm -hmm. You can all see this. Not okay, in so great not, resolution, but yes. Not in great resolution. Okay. I uh, don't see if there's any, I can't see any other particular resolution, I'm afraid. Let's try, let's try a little bit bigger. Um, uh, that's probably okay for me. That's probably okay. Okay. So I'm going to pop you all off just for a moment. You should still be able to see it. Uh, shout if you can't in the text because I won't be able to hear you. Um, I have to actually be here to talk. Of course, of course. Sorry. <laughs> so what I was saying was, let me just do that again. Yeah, I forgot about this particular thing. What I was saying was just to do the sources um, of the material that we're looking at. This is the exterminator. This is on the open library at the Internet Archive. You can just make an account there and you can borrow the book for two weeks. Um, and when you do, you can read it sort of uh, you can read it in this particular look. So if you want to do your source check, and all that kind of thing as scholarly movement, scholarly moment, or just want to read it yourself and have a look at it yourself, um, you can go and look at it on the Internet Archive, the Open Library, and it's available there. As I say, The Exterminator by William S. Burroughs and Brian Geisen. Um, so I'm going to read from page 58. There's a little bit of setup that I'm going to skip from page 55. This is a short story, um, so that's the kind of thing that's worth worth <laughs> worth noting it's a short story so a little bit of video that i was going to show beforehand is this it's a three three and a bit minute video um and it's just about the cut-ups technique and the do easy is one technique and the cut-ups technique is another they're both sort of techniques that bryce bryson uses so i'll just show this
And Matt can't hear you at all. Sorry about that. I'll share. The, I will share the link in River so that you can watch it yourself. It, it was on the screen and it should have been coming through. I was obviously doing something wrong. My mistake there. Anyway, I've popped it into River for those of you. You can check it out afterwards. Should have done the do easy technique before. Yeah, I should have done the do easy technique. Well, that that is an interesting interesting thing to sort of think about. Sheila, hello. You're not in with a video. I can't get you in. Uh, I'm not sure what's going on there. We'll have to kind of follow that through. Okay, so I'm going to just read in the meantime the story so if you can hear me then you should be able to hear the story the kernel issues beginners de de is a way of doing it is a way of doing everything you do de simply means doing whatever you do in the easiest most relaxed way you can manage which is also the quickest and most efficient way as you will find out as you advance in de you can start right now tidying up your flat, moving furniture or books, washing dishes, making tea, sorting papers. Consider the weight of objects, exactly how much force is needed to get the object from here to there. Consider its shape and texture and function. Where exactly does it belong? Use just the amount of force necessary to get the object from here to there. Don't fumble, jerk, grab an object. Drop cool, possessive fingers onto it like a gentle old cop making a soft arrest. Guide a dustpan lightly to the floor as if you were landing a plane. When you touch an object, weigh it with your fingers. Feel your fingers on the object. The skin, blood, muscles, tendons of your hand and arm. Consider these extensions of yourself as precision instruments to perform every movement smoothly and well. Handle objects with consideration and they will show you all their little tricks. Don't tug or pull at a zipper. Guide the little metal teeth smoothly along, feeling the sinuous ripples of cloth and flexible metal. Replacing the cap on a tube of toothpaste, and this should always be done at once. Few things are worse than an uncapped tube maladroitly squeezed, twisting up out of the bathroom glass drooling paste unless it be a tube with the cap barbarously forced on all askew against the threads. Replacing the cap, let the very tips of your fingers protrude beyond the cap, contacting the end of the tube, guiding the cap into place. Using your fingertips as a landing gear will enable you to drop any light object silently and surely into its place. Remember, every object has its place. If you don't find that place and put that thing there, it will jump out at you and trip you or wrap you painfully across the knuckles. It will nudge you and clutch at you and get in your way. Often, such objects belong in the wastebasket, but often it's just that they are out of place. Learn to place an object firmly and quietly in its place and do not let your fingers move that object as they leave it there. When you put down a cup, separate your fingers cleanly from the cup. Do not let them catch in the handle. And if they do, Repeat movement until fingers separate clean. If you don't catch that nervous finger that won't let go of that handle, you may twitch hot tea across the duchess. Never let a poorly executed sequence pass. If you throw a match at a wastebasket and miss, get right up and put that match in the wastebasket. If you have time, repeat the cast that failed. There is always a reason for missing an easy toss. Repeat toss and you will find it. If you wrap your knuckles against the window jam or door, if you brush your leg against a desk or a bed, if you catch your feet in the curled up corner of a rug or strike a toe against a desk or chair, go back and repeat the sequence. You will be surprised to find how far off course you were to hit that window jam and that door, that chair. Get back on course and do it again. How can you pilot a spacecraft? If you can't find your way around your own apartment. It's just like retaking a movie shot until you get it right and you will begin to feel yourself in a film moving with ease and speed. But don't try for speed at first. Try for relaxed smoothness, taking as much time as you need to perform action. If you drop an object, break an object, spill anything, knock painfully against anything, galvanically clutch an object, pay particular attention to retake. You may find out why and forestall a repeat performance. If the object is broken, sweep up pieces and remove from the room at once. If object is intact, or you have duplicate object, repeat sequence. You may experience a strange feeling as if the objects are alive and hostile, trying to twist out of your fingers, slam noisily down on a table, jump out at you and stub your toe or trip you. Repeat sequence until objects are brought to order. Here is student at work. 
At two feet, he tosses red plastic milk cap at the orange garbage bucket. The cap sails over the bucket like a flying saucer. He tries again. Same result. He examines the cap and finds that one edge is crushed down. He pries the edge back into place. Now the cap will drop obediently into the bucket. Every object you touch is alive with your life and your will. Student tosses cigarette box at wastebasket and it bounces out from the cardboard cover from a metal coat hanger which is resting diagonally across the wastebasket and never should be there at all. If an ashtray is emptied into that wastebasket, the cardboard triangle will split the ashes and the butts, scattering both on the floor. Student takes a box of matches from his coat pocket, preparatory to lighting cigarette from new package on table. With the matches in one hand, he makes another toss and misses, of course, his fingers are in future time, lighting a cigarette. He retrieves package, puts the matches down, and now stopping slightly, legs bent, hop skip over the washstand and into the wastebasket. Miracle of the Zen master, who hits a target in the dark. These little miracles will occur more and more often as you advance in DE. The ball of paper tossed over a shoulder into the wastebasket. The blanket flipped and settled just in place that seems to fold itself under the brown satin fingers of an old Persian merchant. Objects move into place at your lightest touch. You slip into it like a film, moving with such ease you hardly know you are doing it. You come into the kitchen, expecting to find a sink full of dirty dishes, and instead every dish is put away and the kitchen shines. The little people have been there and done your work, fingers light and cold as spring wind through the rooms. The student considers heavy objects. Tape recorder on the desk taking up too much space and he doesn't use it very often, so put it under the washstand. Weigh it with the hands. First attempt the cord and socket leaps across the desk like a frightened snake. He bumps his back on the washstand, putting the recorder under it. Try again, lift with legs not back. He hits the lamp. He looks at that lamp. It is a horrible disjointed object. The joints tightened with cellophane tape disconnected when not in use the cord leaps out and wraps around his feet, sometimes jerking the lamp off the desk. Remove that lamp from the room and buy a new one. Now try again, lifting, shifting, pivoting, dropping on the legs, just so and right under the washstand. You will discover clumsy things you've been doing for years until you think that it is just the way things are. Here is an American student who for years has clawed at the red plastic cap on English milk bottle. You see American caps have a little tab and he has been looking for that old tab all these years. Then one day in a friend's kitchen he saw a cap depressed at the centre. Next morning he tries it and the miracle occurs. Just the right pressure in the centre and he lifts the cap off with deft fingers and replaces it. He does this several times in wonder and in awe and well he might... Him, a college professor and very technical, two plenarian worms learn quicker than that for years he has been putting on his socks after he puts on his pants. So he has to roll up pants and pants and socks, pants, so he has to roll up pants and pants and socks, get clawed in together, so why not put on the socks before the pants? He's learning the simple miracles, the miracle of the washstand glass. We all know the glass there on the rusty razor blade streaked with pink toothpaste, a decapitated tube writhing up out of it. Quick fingers go to work and the glass sparkles like the holy grail in morning sunlight. Now he does a wallet drill. For years he has carried his money in his left side pocket of his pants, reaching down to fish out the naked money, bumping his fingers against the sharp edge of notes. Often the notes were in two stacks and pulling out the one would drop the other on the floor. The left side pocket of the pants is most difficult to pick, but worse things can happen than a picked pocket. One could dine out on that for a season. Two manicured fingers sliding into the well-cut suit wafted into the waiting hand an engraved message from the Queen. Surely this is the easy way. Besides, no student of DE would have his pocket picked applying DE in the street, picking his route through slower walkers. Don't get stuck behind that baby carriage. Careful when you round a corner. Don't bump into somebody coming around the other way. He takes the wallet out in front of a mirror, removes notes, counts notes, replaces notes as rapidly as he can with no fumbling, catching note edges on wallet or other errors. That is a basic principle which must be repeated. When speed is crucial to the operation, you must find your speed, the fastest you can perform the operation without error. Don't try for speed at first. It will come. His fingers will rustle through the wallet with a touch light as dead leaves and crinkle discreetly the note that will bribe a South American customs official into overlooking a shrunk down head. The customs agent smiles a collector's smile, the smile of a connoisseur. Such a crinkle he has not heard since a French jewel thief with crudely forged papers, made a crinkling sound over them with his hands, and there is the note neatly folded into a false passport. Now some will say, but if I have to think about every move I make, you only have to think and break down into movement 
into a series of still pictures to be studied and corrected because you have not found the easy way. Once you find the easy way, you don't have to think about it. It will almost do itself. Operations performed on your person, brushing teeth, washing, etc., can lead you to a correct, can lead you to correct a defect before it develops. Here is a student with a light case of bleeding gums. His dentist has instructed him to massage gums by placing little splinters of wood called interdens between the teeth and massaging gum with seesaw motion. He snatches an interdens, opens his mouth in a stiff grimace and jabs at a gum with a shaking hand. Now he remembers his DE start over. Take out the little splinters of wood, like small chopsticks joined at the base, and separate them gently. Now find where the bleeding is. Relax face and move into dens, up and down, gently, firmly, gums relaxed. Direct your attention to that spot. No, not getting better and better. Just let the attention of your whole body flow there and all the healing power of your body flow with it. A soapy hand on your lower back, feeling the muscles and vertebrae, can catch a dislocation right there and save you a visit to the osteopath. Illness and disability is largely a matter of neglect. You ignore something because it is painful and it becomes more uncomfortable through neglect and you can neglect it further. Everyday tasks become painful and boring because you think of them as work, something solid and heavy to be fumbled and stumbled over. Overcome this block and you will find that DE can be applied to anything you do, even to the final discipline of doing nothing. The easier you do it, the less you have to do. He who has learned to do nothing with his whole mind and body will have everything done for him. Let us now apply DE to a simple test. The old Western quick draw gunfight. Only one gunfighter really grasped the principle of DE and that one was Wyatt Earp. Nobody ever beat him. Wyatt Earp said, it's not the first shot that counts, it's the first shot that hits. Point is to draw aim and fire and deliver the slug an inch above the belt buckle. That's DE. How fast can you do it and get it done? It is related that a young boy once incurred the wrath of two-gun McGee. McGee had sworn to kill him and is even now preparing himself in a series of saloons. The boy has never been in a gunfight and Wyatt Earp advises him to leave town while McGee is still two saloons away. The boy refuses to leave. All right, Earp tells him. You can hit a circle four inches square at six feet, can't you? All right. Take your time and hit it. Wyatt flattens himself against a wall, calling out once more, Take your time, kid. How fast can you take your time, kid? At this moment, McGee bursts through the door, a forty-five in each hand, a spitting lead all over the town. A drummer from St. Louis is a bit slow, hitting the floor and catches a slug in the forehead. A boy peacefully eating chop suey in the Chinese restaurant next door stops a slug with his thigh. Now the kid draws his gun, steadies it in both hands, aims and fires at six feet, hitting two-gun McGee squarely in the stomach. The heavy slug knocks him back against the wall. He manages to get off one last shot and bring down the chandelier. The boy fires again and sends a bullet ripping through McGee's liver and another through his chest. The beginner can think of DE as a game. You are running an obstacle course. The obstacle is set up by your opponent. As soon as you attempt to put DE into, into practice, you will find that you have an opponent very clever and persistent and resourceful, with detailed knowledge of your weaknesses, and above all, expert in diverting your attention for the moment necessary to drop a plate on the kitchen floor. Who or what is this opponent that makes you spill, drop and fumble, slip and fall? Grodek and Freud called it the it, a built-in self-destructive mechanism. Mr. Hubbard calls it the reactive mind. You will disconnect it as you advance in the discipline of DE. DE brings you into direct conflict with the it in present time, where you can control your moves. You beat the it in present time. Take the inverse skill of the it back into your own hands. These skills belong to you. Make them yours. You know where the wastebasket is. You can land an object in that wastebasket over your shoulder. You know how to touch and move and pick up things. Regaining these physical skills is, of course, simply a prelude to regaining other skills and other knowledge that you have but cannot make available for your use. You know your entire past history. Just what year, month, day and hour everything happened. If you have heard a language for any length of time, you know that language. You have a computer in your brain. DE will show you how to use it, but that's another chapter. DE applies to all operations carried out inside the body, brainwaves, digestion, blood pressure, and rate of heartbeats. And that's another chapter. And now I have stray cats to feed in my class at the Leprosarium. Lady Sutton Smith raises a distant umbrella. I hope you find your way, the address in empty streets.
Okay, I hope you could hear that. <laughs> I've just seen a message there, and I'm assuming it from earlier. It doesn't have a timestamp on it. Um, right, let's see if I can get John in. Hello, John. Um, hello, John. John's coming in. <laughs> so maybe that's, I mean, I don't know. I like this kind of, there's a very beautiful text, I think, here. And there's a kind of really strange relationship to language. It's very... You know, there's lots of novelistic and poetic moments. It's very Burroughs and all that kind of stuff that we could maybe do literary criticism of. Um, but it was because of this kind of relationship to the it and this particular kind of way of, of, of dealing with it that I thought it might be interesting. There's obviously lots of other bits. Hello, John, can you say hi? <laughs> say hi so we can check this out. That's him very much. Yeah, okay. I can. Yeah, I can hear you. Um, I'm still ah, stuck good. in a hotel room with other with other, other people, so uh, and they're just calming down and going somewhere else. So that's why the camera's not on. Okay, no problems at all, man. Yeah, just do. <sighs> Sam is apparently in the waiting room, but can't get in. Is there a max number of people? No, here he is. Here we go. Sam, hello, Sam, and I still don't know who Sheila is. <laughs> I think that as we try it, should, I can't see any video on Sheila, so I'm going to leave it for a moment. Is there have they mentioned anything on River? Anyone on River said something? No, no one on River has said anything, so I'm not quite sure who Sheila is. If you can hear us, Sheila, you're welcome to sit there. Um, but uh, say that, say that, was that you, Sam? Must uh, be Helen. Not me. Okay. Well, I will drop Sheila in. If you can hear us and you want to speak, then you'll have to check in in the moment. Any thoughts on the boroughs, that if you could hear that? Morrigan. I, I mean, I, firstly, that was so beautiful, I nearly cried. <laughs> it was just so beautiful. Um, and also i had a bit of a wry smile to myself uh because it it, it was like a an existential version of condo wasn't it um <laughs> and it and it sort of like shows where things can go minus consumerism so that was that was really cool and the um i i was just thinking about all the times when time is slow um that is clicking i was just thinking about all, all the times when time is slow you know when things have have happened that otherwise i would miss or or a, a deliberate attempt to slow time down so i had this slightly sort of odd experience on saturday that get that goes back to the matchstick thing just bear with me it's not a random story i was lighting um my father-in-law's cooker to uh cook uh using a match and i needed to then get rid of the match because i don't like putting used matches in match boxes i like match boxes to only have fresh matches in and so i was handing the used match to my father-in-law who has um sensory issues uh particularly around grasping uh with his hands um 15 minutes we stood there <laughs> with me passing him this match but in this sort of and him just trying to grasp the end of the match um but in this 15 minutes it was like time completely stood still and in making that time stand still it had a profound effect on each of us mentally you know what I mean? I, I wasn't rattling on and he wasn't just trying to grasp the match. It wasn't sort of this fraught thing in making the time slow down sufficiently. It was like I met him repeatedly over this period, if that makes sense. You know, initially I met a person that couldn't get hold of the match. Um, then I met my own worries about the person that couldn't get hold of the match and he met his worries about not being able to get hold of the match. You know, anyway, and it goes on and on and on and on and on. Um, and, and we have various sort of conversations throughout, but it's like, it was like we, we engaged and disengaged and engaged and re-engaged. And in the end, we just, uh, we were just 
standing in the kitchen hugging each other. Um, and he did get hold of the match in the end um, and put it in the bin. Um, and we were just standing and hugging each other. But it was that idea that we met each other a, a mul in a multiplicity of ways through this simple exercise of trying to put the match in the right place. Anyway, that, that just made me think of that. Anyone else have a, have a comment? Same as last week. If you want to X in chat, then I'll definitely know that you want to say something. Otherwise, uh, you know, just jump in, jump in. Does it, does it sound like a reasonable account of the id? <laughs> let's, let's be the philosophical element here. It's, it, if people are unsure what the id is, we can all recap on that. But but when we're, when we're dealing with the... I mean, this is a very curious way of dealing with the id. I mean, the, 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 the mistakes he's making, or he's talking about people making... Mm. Um, are equivalent to, in essence, Freudian slips. Okay, that's what I would sort of say is the analogy here. So when Freud is talking about the psychopathology of everyday life, in which he discusses things like Freudian slips and the way in which your your desire, your sub, your unconscious, this kind of, you know, this repressed element is finding its way to kind of, you know, encounter the world, dialogue itself with the reality principle, these kind of elements that Freud talks about there, and you know, he, he uses his idea of the Freudian slip as this kind of mistake that reveals. Um, and in a sense, Burroughs is doing something like an inverse. It reveals something, but it doesn't reveal like your your irrational real desires or the fucking primary id of Oedipus or any of this kind of stuff. It reveals your incompetence or the fact that things are alive or it reveals something else. Um, and, and as he says there, that take the inverse skill of the it back into your own hands you know take this kind of mistake that you've made instead of feeling like somehow it's this irrational desire this this freudian oedipal you know drive that's going through you this enemy this opponent take it back into your own hands you know um, and there's something i think really interesting in that um, and it's really interesting i think for me because it connects to the conversation the discussions i've had around automata and around roles and around groups this kind of you know, all those kind of moments that we kind of make a mistake, we make a slip, or we feel like we've made a, a slip or a mistake, or one of those kind of things that are sort of similar, similar equivalent. So that's kind of how I encounter the burrows. Um, I'll jump in. Uh, I like the piece. Uh, it makes me want to try the exercises to think i feel like i i read it many years ago maybe i don't know um maybe that's just the the naturalness of the idea and and to the idea the idea like because it, it feels like it's actually very common sense um and it does seem to rhyme with and it mentions zen pops up in the uh it's at some point there's a very common element of that and you know it's 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 very close to a bit of stuff um um i feel one thought that occurred to me was um wondering if uh if the the reason it it's a, it feels quite appealing at the moment um is uh reaching a certain age where um you start to get very frustrated with your own self-sabotage um and the the way you get in the way um and i wonder if that was something i would have felt 10, 15 years ago, um, now that I'm in my 30s, um, suddenly the idea of simply trying to get really good at putting toothpaste on my toothbrush is like, wow, what a, what a challenge. <laughs> what a, what, a, what a, an act of self-overcoming this could be. Um, yeah. 
Um, I think I had more theoretical thoughts, but uh, in response to you, Matt, but I'll, I'll maybe come back to that kind of formulated thing in my head a bit more. Well, I wasn't thinking about Freud and the id at all when when you were reading that. Um, so I'm going to take the conversation somewhere completely different for a minute. Um, I, well, we spend the day tidying our basement, which was, uh, which is one of those jobs that we've been putting off for like half a year or longer. Um, and it's full of, it was full of, crap and stuff and stuff that we don't know where it came from and other stuff and you know like how these things accumulate um so when i was listening to you i was thinking about something that i was thinking today when i was tidying the basement uh which is also something that we kind of talked about last week um about kind of um well last week we talked about care um and i was thinking today about um, caring about objects and caring about stuff that you have and how you look after them and like and I was thinking you know, why do we keep so much stuff <laughs> and I was like well obviously because we like really care about having that stuff like you know tools are really important maybe we don't use them every day but you know like you're not gonna throw away tools and that kind of thing like, you justify to yourself but obviously that means like you ca you care about them you value them in some way uh, but then also, how do you show these objects the care that that um, that, that you care about them? You know, like we, we, Sam spent some time de-rusting things, and then you know we we're wiping everything that was moldy or dusty, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so when you were reading about this, I was thinking about, um, um, or you, when you're reading Boris, I was thinking about this, and I was thinking, you know, like he, in 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 the stuff that you're reading, it was all about like taking care of like how you do things and almost like I was imagining a form of like mindfulness of doing things um like being mindful of how you put your cup of tea down and um and for me that's kind of a, a way of caring for objects or like for for spaces or for um for things that are around you I know that's what I was thinking but I'm trying to dig out the text now so I can see the it bit because I was obviously not paying attention to that bit Wait, did anybody hear me? Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> I, 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 I just talked to myself. <laughs> I was allowing space this week. I thought I would allow space and see how how space felt when we were all together and and we weren't mm -hmm. doing rounds. Um, but yeah, so other people might have thought. Did, 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 so meet yourself, self overcoming mindfulness. These have all popped up. Um, I think they're all kind of interesting and useful things. There is actually Ginsburg. Uh, now let me see if I can share the screen for you because I should be able to. Um, let's pop that on. The piece here from Ginsburg. Uh, oh, that's a bit. Uh, you probably won't be able to see this. Uh, what if I can put it up? There we go. Um, let's make that a bit bigger. <clears throat> uh, so yeah, this is this is sort of Alan Ginsberg project. This is a website you can go and look at. Ginsberg was a beat poet. He was a collaborator of Burroughs. In case you're not familiar with him, he's very interesting. He's uh, American poet from the 50s and 60s, uh, most famous for writing a text called Howl, um, which if you haven't read, it's really worth reading Howl. Um, it's a very, very beautiful and interesting text. But did, but but he but he here it says uh, you know uh, about the Burroughs piece uh, another proclamation from William Burroughs this is somewhat a mindfulness proclamation and so he identifies this very clearly as mindfulness and talks later a little bit here sort of a he, he, there's a character so do easy is being is being it, it's part of a it's part of a character called Colonel Sutton Smith. And this character reappears various times in Burroughs' work. And, and so the Do Easy text is actually sort of embedded 
in a kind of Kierkegaardian moment, if you like, where there's an author for that text that's not William Burroughs, just like, you know, in Fear and Trembling, it's Silencio, Johannes de Silencio. Um, and Kierkegaard writes in these pseudonyms, well, Burroughs does as well. So Do Easy is written under the pseudonym of Colonel Sutton Smith. Um, and but, but um, Ginsburg calls it um, a sort of a parody of an English ex-military Zen man. This girl, um, that's who he is. Uh, and what's interesting is that Burroughs, he says, outlines is a kind of precision and mindfulness, very similar to, say, Zen gardening or flower arrangement or archery. Burroughs' own system, which with his usual humour, he even parodies or he sets forth and then parodies. You have, here, you have here also Barra's accounting of returning to present consciousness and present space. So you could say this, to begin with, is a somewhat Vajrayana-style parody of what he respects, which is total precision. Um, and so that's there's something that's on a relationship to Zen and accuracy or precision. There's, there's a kind of a craftedness that Ginsberg wants to point to there, as well as, as, well as what we normally think of as mindfulness. Um, and it was interesting that you mentioned tools there, because um, obviously they're connected to a kind of crafting relationship to things, that kind of working with stuff. And there is in the text this beautiful sense of objects. And I think when he talks about the it, um, and when he's describing the relationship to objects, to bumping into objects or to, or to objects feeling alive and, and having this kind of will, I think he has um, a way of describing the flow that Freud talks about as desire as much less, um, much less, as it were, originating inside the human being as a kind of counterpoint, you know, that kind of element in, in, in Freud that goes all the way back to Plato, where we kind of have these two forces, the black horse and the white horse. Um, whereas what, what Burroughs is doing is, is shifting us out of that into a situation in which the opponent isn't really inside us it's more to do with the flows that we're working with um, and these objects are part of these flows these flows through and in them with these objects and i think this is actually quite a fundamental shift and it's very close to what schizoanalysis would call desire as opposed to what freud would call desire and it's very close to what i think a schizoanalytic notion of of an it would be as opposed to what a freudian notion of an it is remembering that the it is just a name you know the id is just a posh name for the it um, so I think there's there's kind of a kind of um, quite a radical paradigm difference in some ways inside this mo inside these kind of moments. Um, I'm going to switch my mic off and allow someone else to speak. <laughs> X Sam. When you were reading out the text, it made me think of I think about I think driving. About driving. Oh God, I've got an echo. Um, like a the the kind of muscle memory that you rely on for a lot of driving and i was thinking you know, you know what if you applied that very deliberate bringing to consciousness all of the reflexes involved in driving it's really really hard but what i found then i moved on to thinking about was well you kind of do have a really interesting relationship with you as conscious driver focusing on the road you know that when you do your theory test you have to spot all the hazards and stuff and normally when you're driving, the back of your brain kind of does that for you to an extent. But sometimes you need to concentrate in order to make sure that you're doing it. So like, it almost feels like when you're driving that you have this shifting relationship backwards and forwards between you know, the muscle memory you that you can rely on to not crash if you're listening to the radio or what have you. And uh, the conscious you that is able to kind of take control to a certain extent, which feels a lot nicer than how I kind of feel about the id, ego and superego which does feel very conflictual yeah but i kind of got that picture of something which is much more like you know you can you can you can assume control when you want to for particular things but you can also surrender control for your body or your habits or whatever to do their thing and you can kind of your consciousness can do something else Morgan. Yeah, that's something I was going to mention first time round. Uh, driving, I, I ride a motorcycle. Um, 
there is no muscle memory that you're relying on <laughs> when you ride a motorcycle. Nothing is happening unconsciously at the back of your mind. It all ha has to happen consciously at the front of your mind. It all happens consciously at the front of my mind. So I can remember um, after I'd done about a thousand miles on a, my first thousand miles, I realized that what, what I wanted to be able to do was stop. And when I came to a stop, because I watched a guy do it once, plant my foot. So heel and turn, just plant it. So come to this dead, beautiful, controlled stop, heel and toe, lean the bike, and then you knock it into neutral. And you it, it's like a series of things that you do. And then you have your one foot up and you've got it's on the brake and sort of resting on your peg. And it's this, it's one of the reasons I absolutely love riding, is everything becomes this super conscious, slow but fast because it has to be because things happen fast but you have this weird relationship with time where you have to do all the thinking and for all the thinking to fit in you kind of have to slow down time it's a really strange thing that kind of happens and I drive a car I've driven a car for 35 years and it's not the same process at all and so this kind of doing easy as well it um the other thing about riding a motorbike is you can't do it when you're when you're when you're you can't hold your body rigid because if you hold your body rigid you hang on to the handlebars rigidly and then that makes you more likely to be you know you're a rigid it's like if, if a wind hits something that's rigid and vertical it's going to have more of an impact than if it hits something that kind of can roll with the punches if you see what I mean so you have to have this kind of like idea somewhere that you're doing it easily whilst at the same time being super conscious of every single process about it and I I'm I haven't perfected this yet I'm not saying hey I'm great at this. I haven't perfected this yet but it's this interplay between a kind of I, don't, I hate the word mindfulness, sorry. It's this interplay between supra-consciousness and, and being totally present as if, as if you belong in that moment. It, I don't know whether any of that's just made sense, but uh, yeah. And hi, James. Are you Sheila? No. <laughs> 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 you're not sheila we were just checking i think it was helen maybe had sheila i don't know i'm not sure but helen helen's connection doesn't quite isn't quite connecting i'm afraid oh right. uh, hi james how are you hi, um, helen's there i think possibly listening as well uh gabby Ooh. muted sorry uh my fault there um I've been thinking of the id uh, or the drive or whatever you want to call it, um, the it uh, lately, um, like uh, one, a few different metaphors, one of which is like the animal itself, um, kind of thing. but also I kind of think of it like a, like a hydraulic pump. Um, if you can imagine this kind of um, uh, tank of fluid and some kind of uh, pressure pump pushing it through so that it has to go through a whole system of pipes. Um, and I imagine that system of pipes being the self, uh, the brain, the network of neurons, whatever, having this uh, kind of energy stimulation libido, whatever you want to call it, jouissance, desire, chi. Um, fact is, it, it is being pushed through the body, the body-mind, um, and needs to find outlet, needs to find expression in whatever's there. Um, and I feel like... Uh, 
the work of a lifetime really um in most uh kind of mystical traditions that i have some very cursory familiarity with um is uh more or less kind of deepening just sort of increasing those connections with the brain with yourself with the body and so on and so forth such that that hydraulic pressure pushing that it fluid that libido through you um can flow easily uh through all the networks um within your brain uh that are the maps of what you need to do or how you how you do stuff um Yeah, did that make sense? Was it? Yeah. yeah. Sense? I mean, it's it's interesting mentioning metaphors and different metaphors that we're trying to use or different images. I, w I would, I would, I suppose I, I always think of images because it's just a slightly different. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I, I, as a word, it, it often has, I suppose, different connotations for me, different implications. Um, but yeah, for, I mean, Freud himself has these three different modes of thinking about his kind of system doesn't he in a sense he has the economic mode a, a topographical mode and a dynamic mode supposedly this is quite common when you're encountering introductory text to freud you'll find that the, you know the system is described in three different ways at different points um and so the economic i suppose uh would be a bit closer to the hydraulic um but i don't know maybe that's the dynamic um <laughs> there's always these different ways that freud is supposedly described as having his system because it has it has the famous description of the id the ego and the superego but it's kind of second part freud isn't it and there's like an earlier part of freud where it's not quite so clarified it's not so that topographical map that shape of the of the iceberg in which the conscious is the top and the and the underneath the water is the unconscious and all these other kind of things um these are these are kind of one ways of thinking about it i, I suppose uh, i'm curious as to um why <laughs> i mean in a sense why 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 it seems both both like like simple and straightforward and like an obviousness and why at the same time it also feels completely kind of irrelevant in a sense it's like you could do it but you'd only do it for a bit you, like it's so what's irrelevant well it, this kind of do easy technique it's a kind of straight you, you can kind of see it, it i mean that's, this i think is, is partly there in Ginsburg talking about as parody it's kind of like it's a really curious thing to try and do but one of the things that's kind of obvious is that you would never do it all the time <laughs> even if you tried and so there's something about that kind of moment of trying this technique and using this technique and the it's intermittency that is kind of it's it's it, it there's something curious about this because it doesn't feel like i mean yeah, the, the colonel maybe wants everyone to be like you know and to get into that kind of mystical moment i suppose of do easy all the time flowing perfectly whereas i suppose i just think I'm always going to be doing this for a little bit and then falling back into something else and then maybe maybe returning to this technique or something along those kind of lines. Rob? Uh, yeah, I've, I've got a bunch of thoughts, but I'll try, I'll try and like be succinct. But, um, part of it, part of me, like I enjoyed the text and there's, like, I actually have been practicing Zen for quite a few years and there is like some resonance with that stuff but there's also like another side of it which is like it sounds a bit like jordan peterson saying tidy your room <laughs> and like oh god oh god yeah. <laughs> <laughs> fucking terrible isn't it? yeah exactly right so there's a kind of obvious yeah, that, yeah there's that thing of like um actually that is quite good advice but for like for the wrong reasons i think i think um and what else was i gonna say oh yeah there's another thing i picked up on which was quite interesting the hubbard I know um, Burroughs got into Scientology quite early on, and I know he left. He had like a big fallout with with uh, Hubbard, uh, like a public fallout. But um, it made me think about like um, the methods of Scientology of like dehabituating. You know, they have these quite intense methods 
uh, which again, like could they could be put to, to some good use, some interesting use, but they in Scientology they're sort of put to some quite nefarious uses, I'd say, like to be to be sort of nice about it and um that, that, I don't know, like it, it was making me think about techniques of de dehabituizing like um, breaking habits, which um I think is is like a praxis that you can do all the time and and perhaps perhaps it's like about um being an active participant in like the construction of subjectivity rather than just being like a passive um rather than just having it like handed to you like a pre-given thing you're like actively constructing something but then i think the thing he leaves out is like the collective aspect of that and it's all about one person and their waste paper basket or whatever instead of a you know like some sort of doing it in a group or some sort of collective um construction of subjectivity i don't know if that, any any of that makes sense <laughs> no that's great I, it's lovely. that's a lovely comment i mean I, that's when in the when in, when me and eric are talking and i'm and obviously eric can speak for himself but when when i'm talking with eric one of the when we talk about our sort of ideas of of using these three different modes of thinking about like um, the world, subjectivity, and relationship to it. Um, there's the one-to-one, -one, the group, and the community. And when I think about one-to-one, -one, one of the things that me and Eric often kind of repeat to each other, not just people, not just people, you know. And so, in a sense, that one-to-one -one relationship with objects is one of the other things that I kind of encounter in the Do Easy. Sorry, that was a bit of a beep, wasn't it? Um, that was some message in all hands in River just pinging off. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, yeah, that relationship to objects, uh, you know, see, so and 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 you're you're right. I think to notice. I I think I hadn't really sort of thought about that. But the, the collective and that group relationship. These things aren't in this thing. And so there's that that element of schizoanalysis, schizoanalysis in terms of flow through objects is maybe one element. But that element of the social is kind of still missing there. And so maybe that's an, and that's that's also yeah. another thing. That kind Actually, of if I could just quickly add to that point, yeah. which is like. In, so like when we practice them we do it in a sangha so there's always that element of like if if things are going off path or are getting a bit weird someone will pull you up on it so i think it's quite important when you're when you're doing any sort of practice of where you are sort of almost deprogramming these habits in a way that it's quite important to have that like people around you to like tell you if you're being like a bit of a dick or whatever and um i mentioned what a sangha is just so people know it's just like a group a group of people doing the practice together so um sorry I'm pinging so right. my mic out. yeah yeah it's basically a, a group of people doing the same Does practice. It not mean community or something like this Does yeah. It have, yeah 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 <laughs> uh, sam now i was also thinking about the the kind of bringing in the idea of the group or the community as you were rob um i, I was also thinking of <laughs> thinking about uh, uh, about our, our work today sorting out our cellar because that was a lot of kind of collective you know although although it had that kind of precision and thoughtfulness about where things were and and, you know what they lived next to and and moving stuff around that it was it had to be a kind of negotiated collective process but not one in where everyone had an opinion exactly, but one in which the kind of need for things to be well organized and clearly organized and efficiently organized sort of dro drove the process and you know, three of us were involved. So I thought that was quite, quite an interesting uh, interaction. You know, they're, they're sort of played on the same sort of thing as this do easy. But then the other thing I was thinking about uh earlier on was uh, like a kind of a like a sports team you know like a football team or something there's also a kind of do easy kind of you know very strong uh focus on changing habits and developing habits very consciously but, you know if somebody very predictably always pops up in the same place you know on the pitch in a penalty or box or something you know then then everybody has to kind of collectively make sure that that's resolved so that so yeah i agree that there's not there doesn't seem to be a focus in the text but two things jumped off in my head for it 
Okay, Gavin. Um, I was just wondering if the social, collective, and or moral possible um, things you might want to pursue uh, with this um, follow can be said to follow from just the uh, the principle of doing it easy. Um, if the whole point of doing, if you're supposed to follow the path of least resistance, the most easily flowing, the easy thing, then eventually through experimentation, through exploration, kind of thing, find whatever that is. Would that not perhaps inevitably lead to social and collective and ethical um, action? Um, you know, uh, people, you know, there's the, the, the kind of vulgar, easy reaction of like, oh, no, the easiest way to live is to be the is to just follow your own self-interest or whatever. Um, but actually, I don't think that's true. I think that obviously, like human being has, human beings have needs for social, being collect, social and uh, collective collectivity, and that um, if you were to sincerely follow, kind of um, be open to exploring and finding the the path of least resistance in any kind of in your life, you would that would eventually lead you to um, realize that you kind of have to do things that make other people happy as well um and uh make, connect, connect you and make you yeah so i wonder if um if the uh if there's a principle there that you can start with the generally kind of individualistic um tone of the essay um, which I think is, is, is kind of part of the, it's, it's not really part, it doesn't feel like a political decision, it feels just like part of the kind of, that this is an easy, this is a very conversational essay, rather than anything about that. Um, so yeah, can, that's, that's my, that's what I'm wondering at the moment. I think, yeah, I mean, I, I like that idea. I think there's something, um, I think there's something in the presentation, particularly in the way it's presented as a story. So what, what we're presented with is a character. Um, so in a, in, a, in a Deleuzean sense, or you know, they, they, that concept, the idea of a conceptual persona, the kind of particular character, and this particular kind of character is, is as, as Ginsberg mentions, you know, this slightly strange. Um, I think he has the echoes of of some of the kind of uh, of the kernels that might have been interested in Hinduism, <laughs> sort of early nineteen hundreds, late eighteen hundreds, and so this kind of weird cross vector that occurred through imperialism, where certain ideas came back through the colonizers, and, and in a kind of weird fucked up orientalist transformative way but there was still at the same time this kind of weird flow that was moving so and so that character has this uh, you know definitely kind of connection to um i think uh, uh um, an ethic that we encounter and i think that's one of the reasons i, I you know i'm thinking about kind of some of the some of the um some of the difficulties involved in it because the kind of character that's presenting the essay is actually a kind of character i probably wouldn't give two shits about listening to most of the time but you know i'd probably think oh you know just just an old white imperialist with some you know nice excuse for why you've learned from the natives kind of in this in this awful kind of like you know orientalist way um but at the same time there i think you're right i think there's there's a way of thinking perhaps a connection between something like the least the, the root of least resistance something like the nature of the flow the ob, you know the way in which the flow kind of can we use i mean this is this is where you get the philosophical memory can we think of a, of a way in which the flow should work because that 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 should thing there is a really problematic you know or or, or because if we think of the way the flow just does work then the bumping into things and and the freudian slips or you know the waste paper slips um yeah they they are all kind of like you know they're presumably just part of this 
part of the way things are. There's no, there's no way it should. The, the do easy is correcting something, and so there's a kind of norm that it's correcting, in a sense, to, towards um, a kind of framework or value that it's correcting towards. And that I think is what what you I think is how I, I hear what you're saying, Gabby. In a sense, is like that 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 implementation of that kind of norm that it's correcting towards immediately has these social connotations in a way in the same way that would, that to a character perhaps Go on. I, Go. I would say that if, if any norms are present about how an action or an event should be um made um i think it's just it is it should be considered as one of the many different um forces and pressures and acting upon you and the action to that 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 guide your actions that 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 are one of the many different pressures and that you are trying to find the equilibrium that between you know, thing and that's how norms are. sorry morgan you wanted to talk right yes the equilibrium uh the equilibrium i don't think i don't think is is individualistic the equilibrium is uh you know it might be that bin that coat hanger that match that you know all all of those things that we're also in concert with so you know <laughs> betty mentioned the tools you know it the tool is only a tool at the point that someone uses it as a tool um also betty i think you might have my hammer uh, <laughs> but yeah because otherwise it's it's just uh it, it it's just a a, a, a a an object it, i mean particularly something like a hammer a claw hammer or something like that it looks beautiful but it, it it's not a hammer until it's hammering if you see what i mean it's not a claw until it it's used like a claw yeah so uh for me the piece but i don't know an awful lot about kind of the lurcian schizoanalysis for me the piece is like the equilibrium is between uh the person and and everything that is also the person that doesn't immediately seem to be the person if that makes sense no not making sense i can tell from people's faces um the bin the coat hanger the missing the bin the flicking the cigarette packet the um like all of that is the person but not the person it can't be the person the person can't be the cigarette packet and the person can they yeah um and it's more than a relationship it's more than they had that packet now they don't have that packet and the packet is now trash it's more than that it it speaks to the idea that somehow these are intrinsically part of an whole and that as yet the other parts of this whole haven't been identified and the kind of I don't know, maybe doing it easy helps to identify the other things, <laughs> whatever, without them being objects, the other things that are also part of the whole. Um, I sound like a hippie. <laughs> <laughs> okay uh <laughs> i'm just gonna uh, 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 um, move to rob uh, i thought it was really well put actually and i, I take your point that is not i think uh both about other things interacting it's not just an individual thing but i also wanted to say like um uh, i think like what he's bringing up is this idea of like trying to have um this free flow and that's kind of like what zen's about as well like just having this free flow and um but i feel like the obs the the obstacles to the free flow are perhaps like the 
in in a sort of for me like the Deleuze Guattari thing of like how because the desire the that desire or is or whatever has been like um has been like repressed so it's like a it's something to do with like society or the socius or whatever so so there's this so for me like zen is also like this political thing as well because it's like um like liberating trying to like liberate these like desires this id it is like um is is also related to breaking down these like social norms that we we've all sort of um taken on i don't know if that makes any sense i'm sounding <laughs> We're all sounding like bloody hippies. Yeah, right. I know. You sound like a hippie now, yeah, for sure. We all sound like hippies. What's sounding? What does what does sounding like a hippie? What what does that mean? Do you think? I, I think it's a word, like people say it to sort of cast something off, don't they? Like often, it's like I say it myself sometimes, but like um, you know, it's like to 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 sort of uh to sort of I don't know. I, I, <laughs> Helen's saying free flow. Yeah, I'm not in any free flow at the moment, that's for sure. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, I think that's okay. I think that's one of the things about trying to do this in public and, and actually encounter these kind of moments where we are, like, uh, you know, f collapsing. There's a, there's a fantastic video that I was really influenced by, um, or influenced by, really affected by years and years ago um, that was online on YouTube about 15 years ago. I saw this, maybe, maybe yeah, 10, 15 years. And it was Ray Brazier talking about Deleuze and Heidegger and the death drive. And it was this long paper that Ray Brazier, who's this like person who was involved in like, you know, lots of the, the Warwick stuff, um, the Warwick philosophy movement. Um, uh, it, was this, it was this long paper that Ray Brazier was giving. Um, and the, the thing that affected me and, and made me kind of like had an effect on me was that it went on for about an hour and a half, but it actually just collapsed at the end. It just kind of, ra it just kind of ran out. Um, and so, and it was the first time I'd ever seen a paper that literally just, it was like plainly he'd written and not finished and have, and was like flowing in this free flow. And it was a really lovely philosophical flow that was all constructed and had all these lovely moments of like exegesis and, you know, philosophical expertise and all this kind of, you know, craftsmanship in it. Except the most interesting part of it when he was talking about, because he was talking about the death drive, was this kind of collapse towards the end where it just sort of dissipated out. <laughs> And I think that's um, that's sometimes a kind of key moment in trying to do philosophy is that you, you, you get on this kind of moment that, that runs through something and then it kind of dissipates out. And it's, I think, important not to worry about those moments and to enjoy those moments because they can be also the, the moments of embarrassment and like feeling stupid and humiliation and all these other kind of other, other things that our ego tells us we're not meant to do in public. Um, she so hmm, let me just recap meet yourself we meet yourself with objects there's a kind of self overcoming that we mentioned um, and obviously the relationship to mindfulness we've mentioned um, kind of, we, sorry was someone there we mentioned a muscle memory versus a conscious you a muscle, muscle memory you versus a conscious you and a and a supra conscious a supra consciousness in a kind of interplay with the being present. Are we are we using metaphors here that have these kind of two moments? There seems to be a lot of these two moments, like in conflict, in tension around this. Um, various different metaphors for the it, animal self, hydraulic pump, uh, the, the phrase id fluid, that was that was kind of came up. Um, and then we talked a bit about breaking habits, dehabituating, the active passive moments of subjectivity. And then it's kind of missing collective or whether the collective is there, the easy possible transition, using the easy as a possible transition from the, the, the kind of individual to the collective generating social actions. I suppose I'm, I'm I mean, there's 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 an obvious like thing to come back to some of the original intentions around sort of a, the group. There's an obvious thing here, and this is pushing it back to Freud as well, about the objects being words in the case of this, this short story, in the case of the way the character is framed, in the case of the way that philosophy is kind of presented and discussed and, and encountered. Um, I mean, our words, are, I mean, in a sense, our words just equivalent to other objects, but there seems to be something particular about those particular words, those particular kinds of objects. So this, this speaks to 
Lacan so important in a sense because he notices this, but it also speaks to a kind of issue that that thing I mentioned last week about the idea of exiting language. If you exit language in a sense, you make words just the same as any other objects, you know, the same as the waste pas waste basket bin. Is a Freudian slip the same as missing the waste basket? You know, are they are they are they basically the same, or do we think there's some is there a difference there that makes any fucking difference? Here's, here's, here's uh, the question that arises in Burroughs. Um, who or what is this opponent that makes you spill, drop, and thump, flip, and fall? Now, that's a very poetic line. I've quoted that directly. You can see that it's, it's not grammatical. Okay, so it's not a grammatical line. It's, it's, a, it's a plainly kind of poetic line. Who or what is this opponent that makes you spill, drop, and fumble, slip, and fall? There's a lovely rhythm to it. it you know, it, but the slip is there so even i mean I, I don't feel like i'm pushing too hard to sort of think about this in relationship to the freudian slip you know definitely i think it's there and this is this is in the paragraph where he's talking directly about freud uh gabby um i don't think that it's equivalent to freudian slip um the mess in the waste basket um because I think there's a difference between technical um, inability uh, and um, and uh, unintentional intention or uh, missing, which is kind of what uh, the idea of a Freudian slip is. Um, so uh with uh, and i suspect this is comes down to the kind of perhaps the difference between neuroticism and psych psychosis um within freudian or Lacanian thinking but that's a whole kettle of fish um I do think uh, so. There would be a difference, say, but if you're if you're shooting something at waste basket, there's a difference between just being unable to get something in the waste basket, um, and um, let us say you are normally quite capable of throwing something in the waste basket, but on such and such an occasion, such and such a um, getting it in or not has a particular meaning um such that uh you are when you miss you are kind of saying something that you don't mean to say um and i feel that there is a there's a key difference there um there's a difference between uh, this idea of um technical um carelessness whereby um the, your libido your jurisance your desire kind of leaks out where it can because it doesn't have enough um uh outlets to go to um so you you carelessly just uh, throw throw stuff wherever um, versus the uh, the 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 fact that um, you may consciously feel that you were aiming for the waste basket, but in actual fact your body was aiming otherwise. There's a difference there, no? I think. I think you framed the question wonderfully. <laughs> Actually, the unintentional intention, yes, this is Freud. And so the revealing of a meaning in the act. So that kind of that that that's the moment of interpretation. You know, this is the moment of interpret. So instead of it, instead of it being like you say, a technical mistake, it reveals something beyond the technical mistake. It reveals a kind of causation structure of intentionality uh, that's unconscious in the technical mistake um, and i think that that this this is kind of a key a key uh, problem 
a key problem in, because in a sense it's it's uh, i think around it's around this this relationship to what in freud is the unintentional intention um, that reveals some other hidden meaning and irrational meaning or the meaning of the drives it's around this i think that this question around language and the way in which language works um, is kind of thought in terms of schizoanalysis i think they they almost want to if the if there is an unintentional intention it's it's the source of that unintentional <laughs> intention that that shifts in schizoanalysis from the individual's desires and drives into something else into something like the society speaking through you so you so i think it makes a lot more sense um in schizoanalysis to think in terms of economic situations job situations why are people desiring their own repression that's the question there and there it kind of because there's a kind of the, the idea would be something like there's an unintentional intention inside the capitalist system that's pushing or inside the social system as well that's kind of pushing these kind of moments that are self-repressive um, whereas in, in freud obviously that it reveals something else but in the burrows um and this is this is pushing back towards the zen bit uh, maybe as well it, that sense of an unintentional intention seems to be dropped in the in the taoist moment of the path of least resistance that sense of a hidden dynamic seems to be dropped and instead we're dealing with something like when people mention i think the word equilibrium um, or something along those kind of lines and so these i think are quite interestingly different ways and they get kind of all jumbled up and intertwined i think in our encounters with with politics and psychology betty did i did i have you um yeah i just kind of wanted to agree with gabby and bring in another element that i was thinking in relation to that question that you popped underneath like um the person fumbling and and stumbling um because um if we were to make the analogy with a Freudian slip, I think the other reason why it doesn't work is that um, for the mind or the um, unconscious, it works because there is the, the I don't want to use the Freudian terms, but you know, there's the, the ego and um, and the superego and there is like kind of a repression going that's that makes the Freudian sleep, slip and the, the leak. So there is more than one you per se or like more than one element of the soul which we can't really say that for the body if we were to gonna go with the kind of mind body division right there isn't like a part of you who's perfectly capable of throwing the ball perfectly every time and then like another part of you that's suppressing that or, or like repressing that all the time um so there is it's not just a question of ability it's more a question of um or it's also a question of of uh, like the body is just understood as one thing rather than separate things that can be repressed or um, leak out or be controlled or etc okay um gabby yeah i think the difference between is with the freudian slip you have uh the repressed and the return of the, the repressed um and with uh the kind of do easy or the lack of do the, the kind of carelessness type example um, that the essay is pointing out. It's saying that essentially that what we have here is a lack of repression, um, that uh, we need to, through our efforts of concentration, uh, mindfulness, whatever, um, repress the it, the it long enough to find a path um, of ease um, and that we practice and through that practice over time uh, that repression is trained until it becomes an easy flow um, yeah so so it seems like the difference is one is the there is a repression already that needs to the meaning of which the history of which um, needs to be excavated through analysis um, and the other is like, no, there isn't a, there isn't necessarily a history here. Or if there is, there it's, it's only in that the lack of um, professional training might be the result of some 
fear or whatever um so could you think about in 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 the sense of like there is a there hasn't been um a repression um which is what the essay is recommending that's a really nice interesting contrast actually um so does that that sounds quite workable i suppose uh i want to come back to this this kind of come back to this question and think in that situation um if, if we were to take that we would give we'd be able to give two different answers so in the freudian situation who is this opponent who or what is this opponent it's 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 the repressed and the returning repressed <laughs> that is as it were the opponent um whereas in the other situation where you're talking about and i think interestingly this idea of using repression rep repressing some kind of failed flow or getting i mean is that would we call that training perhaps um because we were thinking at one point of maybe it being dehabituation but maybe it's a maybe it's a form of training maybe training is a kind of you know repression i suppose I often, so I suppose in that situation, my answer to who or what is this opponent would be almost in a sense, the body itself. And so there's a kind of, you know, the, the kind of, I mean, there's that very odd and odd sense of, of the cybernetic in the middle of that essay where he talks about this, you know, captain of the spacecraft. Um, and that obviously has just as long and, and problematic histories in, in a kind of dualism in a sense so that would speak against it but that, that opponent would seem to be the body um, hmm, Rob muted yeah I was just reflecting on that and um, I, th I kind of think the the techniques are not about the techniques of finding the flow are not about repression but about kind of like liberation and just letting letting it flow as as is so for me it's like i, I like when i was reading anti-oedipus recently and reading about the um the first connective synthesis um i was thinking that is like what meditation is it's just being in that first synthesis without there's no name there's no me there's no this there's no that it's just like a pure flow of connection so that that's kind of like what i what how i think about it morrigan yeah i mean I, I think i might have misunderstood some of this i think i might have really misunderstood some of this and it was interesting when uh bessie brought up this kind of like uh, mind body separation that is uh i i'm not at all I don't, I don't think there is a separation um and so the idea that something is uh for me a kind of like a technical thing that happens sorry i'm probably paraphrasing you really badly here gabby but this kind of like this this kind of physical as being separate from um mental i don't i don't know how else to put it is is like i i'm not sure it's just a case if you if you aim for the bin and you miss that there is some kind of like fault in 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 your aim or in your you know is that is that the fault is not just around the position of the arm and the and 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 the kind of trajectory of the I, I just don't think it's like that because I don't think it's machinic in any sort of way that is it, it's okay <laughs> sorry okay so uh steering when you're trying to steer something you can't see the the wheels that you're trying to steer in a car for example you can't see the wheels that you're trying to steer and yet somehow you still know what direction those wheels are going in in relation to the steering wheel yeah but the steering wheel isn't the wheel yeah? and you're actually making this really strange movement that's this movement rather than that movement in a car and and the kind of the way that these things are connected is obviously technical it's you know it's an engineered bit of a machine it's obviously technical but somehow there's some part of your my brain that sees past these sort of constructed 
ways of sorry this stuff that's popping up in front of me means i can't really concentrate i've lost the thread of my concentration never mind you can come back to that the seeing through is a, is a kind of technique in phenomenology it's one of the things that heidegger goes on and on about and you see a lot in phenomenology this kind of notion I mean, there was a famous sort of thing about you can't see the eyes that you're looking through and all this kind of stuff. And you can't, you know, you don't see your glasses on the end of your nose if you wear glasses. And practices are often that kind of process in which we see through something that's a technics or a framing or a kind of object. And so maybe there's, maybe there's an encounter with, with the kind of that kind of techniques that we encounter in the do easy that's different from... I mean, this is maybe I'm going to push back a bit and go. There's, there is some similarity with the Freudian slip. So maybe there's a kind of techniques of of how things operate in the do easy. That's kind of analogous to when we encounter the Freudian slip, encountering a kind of framework of how things operate. And obviously, they operate quite differently, and they can be said to be operating quite differently. But it's this revealing moment. Um, they show something. Um, now, I think that's. I think that's been very classically kind of phenomenological in a sense, this sort of idea that something is revealed by its failure or by its breaking down. Um, it's a very, that's the Heideggerian notion of how you encounter tools. Uh, uh, you know, you, you encounter the tool in the, in the point at which it breaks down, otherwise you're just using the damn thing and you're kind of working with it. Um, so tool being is encountered through breaking down. And I, so uh, to go back to who, who or what is this opponent that makes you spill, drop and fumble, slip and fall? I mean, in 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 a in in Fanon and schizoanalysis, and in kind of the kind of political left wing revolutionary relationship to desire, the opponent presumably is something like what Fanon called the sociogeny. You know, the kind of not the social construction, but the kind of uh, because that's a, that's a di that has different implications, like some sort of agency of constructing. But that sociogeny, that kind of route by which we have learned stuff. Um, is revealed in in the in the failures since so the route by which we've learned to walk around drive do all these kind of things the route by which we've learned to treat people in particular kinds of ways or do certain things at work you know so i mean i would be interested in thinking maybe at some point about you know i don't know what how do easy would work in terms of going to work <laughs> You know, what, would, what would be the easiest route to, to having economic, you know, sustainability in your life if you were to take a do easy route, you know, so would it would it be to, you know, like instead of the waste paper basket miss, you know, it would, would this be, you know, um, the kind of moment of what, what, for, what Deleuze called Bartleby, you know, that kind of that, that looks like a kind of moment in which you would say to your boss, well, I'd rather not, you know, not, not you're not going to say no and you're not going to say yes, you say I'd rather not and you just don't do it, and, you know, and workers often do this in work, you know, one of the things that managers complain about is their inability to get workers to to you know do things properly because to be honest they just go eh, you know you can't really make me very easily and i'll just slide by here and you know eh, maybe i'll do it maybe i won't if you're going to hassle me okay i'll do it you know um so maybe there's some maybe the do easy in relationship to work would be a kind of different way of framing it or thinking about it in terms of Instead of having this 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 imperialist kernel, you know, telling us about a kind of meditating structure, I'm aware that it's eight, it's eight thirty four. We've been here for an hour and a half, um, so I'm going to sort of give a, a a last round for comments. Um, James and John, you feel free to jump in at this point and have any last comments or or not. That's also good. Um, so any last sort of thoughts before we close down, and. One of my last thoughts is is uh, if we're going to move to sort of thinking about our own writing, um, this kind of relationship to making mistakes is kind of, a, you know, don't worry about, we can't make mistakes, but the mistakes themselves can be productive somehow, possibly of revealing a meaning, possibly of revealing a failure to use a word in, in the right grammatical way, possibly of using it you know, in a way that's, that's producing something interesting. Um, so that that's kind of my thought here is some of this does relate to the idea of writing and so it's like what what you think of as your mistake or what you think of as your failure when you're trying to write a sentence or write a phrase or something you know perhaps these these can affect how you might think about that but anyway a last round of possible comments john left immediately <laughs> I think that's his computer taking thing. But that was very that was a technical Freudian slip, do you see? <laughs> no? Mm.
I'm pushing this analogy, but I can see that it fails quite reasonably, and people have made good points about where it fails. It doesn't work. Sam. Hmm, after the session last week, uh, I was thinking that it would be interesting to kind of turn what we talk about over the the conversation sort of back onto the group as a kind of reflective question so the last time it was talking about we were talking about groups and uh kind of what it means to be a group and then we, we talked about a lot of stuff but then at the end i was like well you know when we look back at ourselves what can we see of what we've discussed already in it you know as a sort of kind of verification that we're you know looking for things and finding them so what i'm kind of left with again at the end of this uh discussion is kind of you know how as a group are we going to consciously produce habits I'm not suggesting that we do like we necessarily agree to do that but you know we've talked about the, the role of kind of habit in in kind of an intentional habit making so is that something that this group actually would benefit from or, or or you know we've got a kind of reflective practical way of turning what we've discussed back into the group itself that is my thought Gabby uh yeah just um thinking that um so that we didn't talk about freedom uh which uh, was a big topic in the notes some of the notes you posted um uh, before and um and how the idea of this do easy stuff um may relate to um and be a practice for increasing one's freedom um and that's certainly something i'd be interested in because i feel very unfree at the moment despite um having a lot of liberal freedoms um under the law and um and a lot of privileges that a lot of people don't have um materially but uh nevertheless still feel very uh unfree a lot of the time um and in practices like this and others um and that we might engage in collectively or explore collectively is something that um interests me um that quote from of nina simone there's a clip a great clip online you see of nina simone talking um being asked what freedom is and she says freedom is a feeling uh freedom is no fear not a fear at all um can you imagine that and that's quite clear um that's something that's always not far from my from my heart um yeah that's the final thoughts Shall I ask people, or do you just want to go around? I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask, and other people can then sort of see. Rob, Rob, you're at the top of my screen at the moment. How about you? Any last comments? Um, I don't know. I think I just, I like, I like the Nina Simone reference, and I think my one of my favourite songs in the world is uh, "Wish." You know, I wish how, I wish how I knew how it felt to be free, and like it's a song that just it always brings tears to my eyes because it's like so moving to me and um yeah and it's like i suppose it's speaking to what gabby was saying about um what yeah what is the opponent so if, you know we, we haven't quite managed uh, maybe the opponent maybe the opponent is capital maybe the opponent is maybe it's maybe it is maybe it's something else but um like yeah like that sort of i don't know i'm not articulating well but that song really captures it for me like yeah like the this kind of desire to be free you know and obviously nina simone has very specific like his reasons why sh she was probably less free than like i myself but um i think that that song really speaks to something i don't know it's my last comment <laughs> Okay, I'm not going to has I'm not going to ask anyone else. Uh, uh, but I am going to sort of go like okay, last comments if you John, go on. Uh, gentle encouragement there, John. Yeah, I probably my computer keeps going going it's either Absolutely. getting very annoyed with the conversation switching itself off or it's something else <laughs> but, um 
what I like about it is I, I'm not sure if it was talked about with the bits I was off, but Burroughs started this because he killed his wife, didn't he, in, a, in a, with a gun um, in a game of Russian roulette or something like that. And my journey into philosophy started where, when I was in the military, I had um, an exercise. Well, I didn't know it was an exercise. I was I thought it was for real. And I had a weapon with a gun and a dog. And I had two people come on to my area, so I treated them as if they, they were real. And I know now that I could physically kill somebody because if that person had moved, I would have shot him. And that upset my psyche quite a lot but i had to leave the air force because i just couldn't get over the the fact that i could actually physically i know i could physically kill somebody um and i didn't want to have that sort of responsibility so when burroughs talks about going that that's what's happening in the back of my head was i was just doing as i was trained um and i could have taken somebody's life and that's quite a scary thought and so i i'm now thinking internally how that that process happens and things like that so that's what i was interested in most about about it. and i would like to learn more because he obviously had that conversation with himself as well yeah that goes back to something more said earlier about meeting yourself in these relationships to objects um okay all right so i as you may or may not know on river um, if you have been there i we've popped up a little shared text people can obviously pop up other ones i would suggest that we start doing something along those kind of lines popping up little bits of text and next week i will think of something to to read or for us to look at or to think about but it would be great if other people had something to read um, in particular now showing videos may or may not work i'll have to test that out at some other point and let people know whether i can share videos whether it's just a glitch um so obviously we can do youtube things as well um because people do do that they, there's a whole there's a, there's a whole genre of people watching fucking youtube <laughs> in groups and things where you can watch something as well um but yeah so have a think about that because that would be good um one last Call cool. any final comments uh, before we wander off. No, you're all good. You're all good. That's great. Okay, thank you very, very much, everyone, for coming along. I really enjoyed that conversation, um, and it made me sort of think a bit. And I'm going to make some more notes on stuff in those shared docs. Um, I will try and sort of put up not a recap of of what we've done tonight, but a, some notes that I've, I've made if you saw me sort of doing this kind of thing during the thing it was trying to make some notes that i could put them up into the shared document a little bit um obviously that's going to be uh, oh look there's harley <laughs> obviously that's going to be uh, my particular take on things so yeah, that might also spur you to sort of think about things differently and i think i i'm kind of inclined to think that it might be useful for us to, to sort of have in mind that question of the relationship to freedom that seemed to come up at the end a few times and people were resonating with that so maybe we should if anyone's got anything they want to say about the habits, freedom, and the kind of relationship that we've been talking about to that, that might be an interesting thing for us to work on next week as we go forwards. All right. Thanks very much, everybody. Lovely to see you. I'm going to, I've been, I've been riding back from, from Bournemouth today earlier and, and, and then doing work in the kitchen. So it, and this is after a weekend of care work in a, in a, in a, in a very strange festival, which I'll, I'll tell you all about at some point, but probably not online because it was a very strange place, very interesting place and nothing, you know, nothing, no problem, but God, it was a kind of weird, weird, weird weekend. Um, so uh, I, I will maybe not to you all about that at some other points. But thank you very much, and I uh, will catch you next week. As I say, think about you know um, possible things you want to read or, or show or think about or put forward, um, whether that be your own or someone else's at the moment. It's obviously in some way it's easier for us to grab someone else's just as we're pushing forward, but obviously we're moving to do it from ourselves, just reminding us all of that. Um, okay, lovely to see you, everybody. I'm going to say goodbye and chuck you all out. Night -night. Thanks, Dad. See you. Thank you. Hi, I was just saying goodbye to everybody. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Um, that's the end of the stream. As I said, we were thinking tonight about Burroughs essay, Do Easy. Um, I mentioned at the start where you can get that. You can get it on the open library if you want to read about it in, in a text called Exterminator. Um, you can uh, share it. You can borrow it for a couple of weeks for free and have a read yourself. Um, uh, and the, in particular, we're sort of looking at that question, who is this opponent that makes you spill drop, fumble, slip and fall? 
um, and the idea of uh, you know flow and repression so uh, we'll catch you next week hopefully um, and uh, thank you very much and see you soon <laughs>